Do you need to find the skills to How would you tell people that this is? You first, first, first. How would you tell this? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on that. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Welcome back to another part about Jeffrey Tompkins, scientist who of course can't do basic, I was going to say high school math, but that's generous. He struggles with basic, you know, like addition, which is something that you learn when you're like seven or eight or something, I think. I don't know. I don't know how school works, but I know it works where by the time you get a PhD, you should be able to add three numbers. But of course, Jeffrey Tompkins can't do that. Anyway, Last time we were here, we were being told how young Earth creationist geologists have discovered um, supercontinents and are pushing this forward as some kind of great new discovery about flood deposition. You know, the thing that everyone already knows about. And that, uh, yeah, it doesn't really help the flood because of all the obviously not flood sediments that are deposited within these large depositional areas. So, yeah. Jeff? Here you go. And he has not only uh, shown that, but he's shown that these continent, that these deposits cover entire continents. So these aren't little local catastrophes. This is a global catastrophe with these layers covering entire regions of continents and also corresponding to each other between continents. All he's done is notice where large depositional environments are. All he's identifying are large inland deserts and sea transgressions. These are not rock sequences dominated by high-energy depositional environments consistent with a flood. In fact, not all of them are even made of waterborne sediment. I'm glad Clary has nice maps, but they just don't show what he wants and needs them to show. Science has a good idea which rocks are and are not formed by flooding. The absolute first step to getting flood geology off the ground is demonstrating that science is wrong about that, and that essentially any sedimentary rock can be deposited by a flood. Creationists barely even try if they do at all. I don't care how many mega sequences you name. If they're not flood rock, then it doesn't help the flood. And not only that, but we know that the flood happened very quickly because we see these things called polystrate fossil trees. No, we don't. We see trees extending through multiple laminae of the same stratum. A stratum is a layer of rock characterized by a distinct depositional environment. In this case, that environment is a boggy swamp. Laminae are layers within such a stratum that represent relatively short-term cycles, such as seasonal changes in deposition. Now, as you might know, rather by definition, bogs are locations with rapid deposition, and that are quite good at preserving fossils, because what bogs are are literally places that deposit faster than things rot. So, when a creationist tells you that that's such a rare thing, just point out that bogs exist all over the world. Well, how do we know that these trees aren't polystrate? because the depositional environment stays the same throughout their vertical extent. And we can tell it also wasn't just one big flood, because within these formations we have multiple soil horizons. That is, where there was a pause in deposition long enough for soil to form complete with roots and animal burrows, and these happen multiple times in these areas, meaning that the trunks are staying in place over decades or possibly even centuries. Soil horizons take time. After some inundation of a swampy area, it can take years to build up new soil. You certainly don't get soil horizons in flood deposits, nor do you get animal burrows in the middle of them. Only at the top of flood deposits can things like animal burrows exist, and that's because the burrows were made after the flood stopped. Well, what normally happens when a tree dies out in the wilderness? Doesn't matter, because these trees aren't the trees we have available to observe now. These are lycopod trees, from a time when lignin-eating bacteria didn't exist. So we don't know if they were structurally very sturdy, but the fact that one of the main structural molecules in their tissues wasn't being decomposed at all indicates to me at least that they could potentially stay up for years if not decades, and trees even today are already some of the slowest decaying organisms out there, and often leave stumps that last years. It, it, after about you know 20, 30 years or so it rots and decomposes, right? Well why do you have these fossil trees extending up through millions and millions of years of layers, assuming they're millions of years. Which they're not, and no one thinks they are. Why are they extending through all these rock layers that evolutionists would claim formed over millions upon millions of years? No one is claiming that. Bogs deposit material relatively rapidly, and that's what we're seeing here. The real question is why are there soil horizons in flood deposits? 
like a tree is really going to sit there and wait for millions of years to get buried by successive layers. If I only had a brain. Ah, yes, the wonderful creationist straw man. Well, when you look at this, it's obvious it was done in a, in a flood, a very rapidly, quickly, and catastrophically. And you see these polystrate fossil trees all over the Earth. We're in an area here where it's actually hard to differentiate between a slow flood and just everyday life. We know that because there are multiple soil horizons, at least sometimes these areas would be inundated by what might be reasonably termed a flood, although they couldn't have been super high energy because they generally did not displace the in-situ fossils below them. And we know that they had to be spaced out by at least a few years because otherwise we wouldn't have time to establish new soils. It's hard to see how that is consistent with a violent global flood that had enough energy to deposit essentially all the sedimentary rock on Earth in the space of just over a year. And in fact, here's one that not only goes up through a number of sedimentary layers, but also starts out uh, in a coal layer. I would love to take a look at that evidence, but unfortunately, the only place I can find that picture is on creationist websites that give neither a location, a specimen number, or a reference to primary literature on it. So as far as I can tell, the only reason to believe that there's coal there is because Tompkins, the guy who can't add numbers, says so. And so do creationist websites. You'll have to forgive me if that's insufficient for me, given the myriad times creationists have been known to be, shall we say, creative with the data in their studies, and they're also known to have only a loose relationship to things like honesty and fact-checking. And on top of that, why do we see rock layers that are folded all over the Earth and not fractured? Generally, they are fractured, and in fact, creationists have been caught literally hiding the fractures they want to pretend aren't there by just sticking people in front of them as if that would make them disappear from the United States Geological Survey photos of the same formations. But further, rocks under high confinement pressure and high temperature, like what you'd find underground, can and do plastically deform into smooth curves with relatively few fractures. This has been experimentally verified for about a century now. There's no excuse for this. This is the kind of science that creationists pretend to like. Verifiable, observable, repeatable laboratory science. Sorry, Jeff. Well, how can you fold rock if it's, if it's lithified and if it's hard? You can't. You really can, though. Experiments on rock plasticity go back at least as far as 1910. So for over a century, we have known that under some conditions, normally brittle rock can indeed bend. And this isn't a matter of what Ken Ham might call historical science. This is laboratory work. Humans have caused rocks to bend by simulating the heat and pressure found under the surface of the Earth. This is so well established that I think it's reasonable to simply directly quote Wikipedia on this. Quote, Experiments are usually carried out with the intention of characterizing the mechanical behavior of rocks in terms of rock strength. The strength is the limit of the elastic behavior and delineates the regions where plasticity theory is applicable. Laboratory tests for characterizing rock plasticity fall into four overlapping categories. Confining pressure tests, poor pressure or effective stress tests, temperature-dependent tests, and strain rate-dependent tests. Plastic behavior has been observed in rocks using all of these techniques since the early 1900s. The Boudinage experiment shows that localized plasticity is observed in certain rock specimens that have failed in shear. Other examples of rock displaying plasticity can be seen in the work of Cheatham and Nurk. Tests using compression and tension show necking of rock specimens, while tests using wedge penetration show lip formation. These tests carried out by Robertson show plasticity occurring at high confining pressures. Similar results are observable in the experimental work carried out by Handen and Hager and Patterson and Mogi. From these results, it appears that the transition from elastic to plastic behavior may also indicate the transition from softening to hardening. More evidence is presented by Robinson and Schwartz. It is observed that the higher the confining pressure, the greater the ductility observed. However, the strain to rupture remains roughly the same at around one. The effect of temperature on rock plasticity has been explored by several teams of researchers. It is observed that the peak stress decreases with temperature. Extension tests with confining pressure greater than compressive stress show that the intermediate principle stress, as well as the strain rate, has an effect on the strength. The experiments on the effect of strain rate by Cerningetti and Boozer show that increasing the strain rate makes rock stronger, but also makes it appear more brittle. Thus, dynamic loading may actually cause the strength of rock to increase substantially. Increase in the temperature appears to increase the rate effect in the plastic behavior of rocks. After these early explorations in the plastic behavior of rocks, a significant amount of research has been carried out on the subject, primarily by the petroleum industry. From the accumulated evidence, it is clear that rock does exhibit remarkable plasticity under certain conditions, and the application of a plasticity theory to rock is appropriate." End quote. How do you fold rock? Well, it has to be soft, right? You know, it's false. No way. Not this time. No. Anything has to be soft for you to fold it. Uh, no. 
And so we, we see these rock layers folded all over the earth. And we know from the scriptures that it says that, that at the end of the flood, God's, God caused mountain ranges to uplift on the continents, which would fold all these soft sedimentary layers. And we see this all over the world. I mean, it's amazing. There's a, a human being for scale there. I like that still, after all this, at no point is there even an attempt to reference a creationist working on the problem of non-flood deposits in the flood. How do you add a flood to mimic evaporation, wind, and seasonal lake deposition all at the same time? Oh, don't worry about it. Look, here are some already well-explained by science geological formations that could maybe have been caused by a flood, but weren't when you examine them closely. Yeah, that's a pretty good argument for creationism. Also, we don't see any erosion between rock layers. They're laid down uh, quite nicely, one on top of another. Well, first, the flatness is in itself evidence of erosion, since, as you might know, erosion often tends to flatten things. That's sort of the point. Also, there's this thing called Surprise Canyon, which you'd think creationists would know all about given how much they evidently love canyons, except it's not really a canyon today. It's a Paleo Canyon. Complete with tributaries and its own layers, it's cut through. In fact, part of it intersects with the modern Grand Canyon. What is a canyon if not evidence of erosion? So when a creationist like Tompkins says that there's no evidence of erosion between layers, he's just lying to you. What's really interesting is that in 1980, Mount St. Helens uh, erupted, and we were able to look uh, at some geological processes in real time and see how things were, were actually created. This was actually a canyon over 100 feet deep that was carved out of, of sediments that were ash and, and, and sediments that were blown out of Mount St. Helens uh, basically, Spirit, Ra Spirit Lake um, was breached, and a bunch of water came down, and these sediments were still soft. They'd been spewed out from the mountain not long before that, and a canyon uh, was carved out that looks like a miniature Grand Canyon. There's another picture. Look, you can see all the different layers in there. Well, I, we know they didn't take millions of years to form. <laughs> this canyon was formed in a matter of hours. And so it, it's like a miniature Grand Canyon. Except it's not like the Grand Canyon in important ways. For one, the reason no one at all thinks these layers were deposited over millions of years is that they're tough. That is, rock made of volcanic ash. Or at least they will be tough when they actually firmly become rock. And no one thinks that tough takes millions of years to be deposited. Because everyone knows what volcanoes are, or at least all the geologists do. Is the rock of, say, the Grand Canyon to which this canyon is being compared tough? Nope, it's not. It's mostly sandstone, shale, and limestone. You know, things that take longer to deposit. Further, this canyon has smooth bends and no barbed tributaries or switchbacks, unlike the Grand Canyon, which is consistent with rapid erosion, again, unlike the Grand Canyon. But also remember Surprise Canyon? We're here getting acknowledgement that canyons are formed by erosion. So what was eroding the still-submerged flood sediments that Surprise Canyon carved through? And how did it lithify to the point that future flood deposition didn't just erase the canyon features? There will be no attempt to explain this. Creation geologists were able to look at this and, and, and have excellent proof for how modern geological features like the Grand Canyon were actually formed. Oh wow, I'm really looking forward to when the young earthers publish their findings that in fact the Redwall limestone is really tough, despite the fact that, you know, it's limestone. This is like Roger trying to tell me that photons are actually electrons stuck together, and that electrons are both gluons and also muons plus an electron. Oh, and I'm also looking forward to the hydrological analysis of how a horseshoe bend can form from raging floodwaters. Well, let's talk about human evolution just a little bit, and I actually have an, a couple of entire talks I give on human evolution, so I'm just going to kind of give you the highlights, but we know... Uh, that there is nothing in the Bible talking about humans being evolved from apes. In the Bible it says... Let's stop it right there. Once again, the Bible is the one making the claim. And we've already heard that the claim is that humans didn't evolve from other apes. Let's just skip to the actual part where Tompkins LARPs as a science communicator. And in fact, when we look at the fossil record uh, for humans and apes, that's really is all we see, is apes and humans. Well, humans being apes, it's not clear what else you could see. But are humans really apes? Well, let's take a look. I think just about everyone, including creationists, can agree that humans are mammals. Humans produce milk, they have hair, they have glandular skin, they have a distinct division of their dorsal vertebrae into thoracic and lumbar vertebrae, they have a dentary squamosal jaw joint, heterodont and diphodont teeth, 
and they're reasonably good at maintaining a constant core body temperature. Well, if we can tell that humans belong to the classification of mammals by noting that they have the characteristics of mammals, then it sets up a precedent that you could at least in principle check with other smaller taxa to see if humans fit into them. For example, humans lack the defining traits of carnivorans, that is, carnassial teeth. So we can safely exclude them there. Humans don't walk on hooves that extend from the tips of their toes, so we can exclude them from artiodactyla and parasodactyla fairly easily. But what about primates? Well, humans have enlarged brains, forward-facing eyes that are in fully enclosed orbits. They have dexterous grasping hands, nails rather than claws, and a wide range of motion of their upper limbs. That's what defines primates. Well, they also have dry noses, which is what separates out the monkeys from the other primates. So humans seem to be monkeys. Well, humans also have a tail that does not extend beyond the body wall and ends in a coccyx. They have a ball and socket shoulder joint, and importantly, Y5 molars, all of which are the defining characteristics of apes, or hominids. So humans, by the same virtue that they are mammals, are in fact apes. So let's be clear, regardless of the evolutionary history of humans or lack thereof, the fossil record of them and other apes will be a fossil history with apes and humans, because that's the same thing as saying the fossil record of deer is a record of deer and artiodactyls. Which it is. Deer being a group of artiodactyls. Everything in between there is an artist's imagination that they, that they put in the picture to try and get you to believe that humans evolved from apes. Well, let's take a look at this. It's the original March of Progress from Rudolf Zollinger's book Early Man, published 1965. You know, only about 50 years ago. First, I don't like this drawing because it makes human evolution seem orthogenic, like it was always leading to modern humans as some kind of goal. That's not actually what happened, as that's not how evolution works. And also, we've cut off a fair bit of this because there are in fact many more organisms in the full-scale drawing. But let's see if this is just imagination, or if there are actual animals underlying the various transitional forms listed. First up is Pliopithecus, one of the earliest known apes in the loose sense. It may have been a stem ape, or a stem hylobatid, that is, a stem gibbon. While it's almost certainly not directly ancestral to humans, it still shows the morphology of the earliest hominoids. Next up is Proconsul. Proconsul is a much better known animal than Pliopithecus, and it is so perfectly intermediate between hylobatids and hominids that it's not clear if it's in either group or perhaps basal to both. It's basically the perfect transitional species. Dryopithecus is next. Its remains are fairly fragmentary, but what is known puts it towards the base of hominidae, the family of great apes, humans included. Up next is Oreopithecus, and it's again both fairly well known and so perfectly transitional that it's not clear if it's a hominin, basal to chimps and humans, in its own subfamily, or what? This is what we should expect in transitional forms, difficulty in placing them into what are today reasonably distinct taxa. Next, we have what's listed as Ramopithecus, but is now called Sivopithecus. It is transitional, but not between basal apes and humans, but rather between basal apes and orangutans. It shouldn't really be in this list, but in 1965, no one really knew that. After this is Australopithecus africanus, which is both well-known and supremely transitional. Then comes something labeled Australopithecus robustus, but which is now known as Paranthropus robustus, and is part of a sister lineage to genus Homo, both of which emerged from Australopithecus by most estimations. Next we get to Homo erectus, which is too bad as it skips over Homo habilis, but oh well, it was the 60s and they didn't know as much as we do now. Homo erectus is a hominin that managed to colonize essentially all of the old world, and is found in Europe, Africa, Asia, and even Polynesia. The rest are just Homo sapiens, and I don't know why they're broken into so many entries, but once again, maybe it's a thing about being nearly five decades old. So none of these are imaginary creatures, some of them like Pliopithecus, and Dryopithecus are indeed known from only fragmentary remains, and so the reconstruction is fairly speculative, although I would love to know what Tompkins would think would be more plausible. As for the animals like Homo erectus or Australopithecus africanus, they are a very well-known species with hundreds of individuals known for each. Very little speculation is needed in reconstructing these species. And in fact, when we look uh, at the fossil record and we look at humans, human tools, artifacts, and footprints, we actually have the presence of humans on the Earth, if you want to accept these evolutionary dates and timelines, we actually have humans on the Earth before this group of fossil, fossils called Australopithecines, which were basically supposedly the first hominids evolving from apes. Interesting, because the earliest material that can be attributed to genus Homo is at most 2.8 million years old. Lucy, on Australopithecus afarensis, is 3.2 million years old. There is a known 3.8 million year old specimen of the same genus known. So it seems like this is just a lie. Australopithecus seems to be about a million years older than Homo. Weird how a creationist would just lie about what science says in an effort to discredit it, isn't it? But actually Australopithecines were nothing more than chimp-like creatures. 
Chimp-like creatures with canines that were reduced, but not as reduced in humans, had a jaw shape that's intermediate between that of chimps and humans, had prognathism intermediate between chimps and humans, and walked upright. Kind of the perfect early hominin intermediate, really. Like, if you had to invent an intermediary between a Miocene ape and a human, it's hard to think of something more perfect than Australopithecus afarensis. But we actually have humans existing before they did based on, uh, based on this archaeological and paleontological evidence. Notice how the evidence given is a graph with no citation. You know what that is? It's nothing. The evidence given is nothing. The fact of the matter is, um, humans have always been humans, and there's just a lot of variation within humans. See how we haven't been given any kind of definition we could use to tell when something is a human versus when it's just a non-human ape? Convenient how with no definition they can just dump whichever taxa they want into the human category and then just arbitrarily declare that other hominins are just apes and not human at all. With no definition, you can just do what you want. Who can say you're wrong? Although just as importantly, no one can say you're right, and with no actual definitions, your statements literally mean nothing, but who cares? They're not for being accurate or meaningful. Creationist statements about which animals are or are not human are about making the duped believers feel good and like their beliefs about human origins aren't absurd and already falsified. And it, but what about these so-called archaic traits uh, the evolutionists claim existed in, in things like Neanderthals and, and so forth? Well, it turns out those traits are still with us today, such as a pronounced brow ridge or a sloping forehead. Brow ridges do indeed vary widely in humans, but you'll notice that this man doesn't actually have a sloping forehead like a Homo erectus or a Neanderthal, and clearly has a high forehead, as is unique to Homo sapiens. His skull couldn't be mistaken for any other described species of hominin besides H. sapiens. So there's a dentist um, in South Africa who actually is a Christian and takes pictures of his patients that have these features, and look at this guy's brow ridge. I can assure you he uh, is alive and well today, and just because, say, Homo erectus or Neanderthals had large brow ridges, big deal, they're still with us today. Brow ridges, yes, but there are also characteristics that set Homo sapiens apart, like the chin, the high forehead, and the globular-shaped brain case. Also, there are things that set Neanderthal apart, like the larger brain volume, the more elongated brain case, and the occipital bone at the back of the skull. And of course, not being H. sapiens, they don't have chins. Here's a bunch of athletes uh, from Eastern Europe, and you look at them and they have huge brow ridges and sloping foreheads. And I can assure you they're alive and well and with us today. Nope, not a sloping forehead among them. I love that Tompkins will just lie about what's on screen. What a low opinion he must have of his audience to think that it's appropriate to just lie to their faces with the evidence that he's lying right on screen in front of them. It's interesting that these characters are actually from the same region uh, of the world where we find a lot of Neanderthal. Uh, skeletons. What about this guy? Well, his forehead certainly does slope more than most Homo sapiens foreheads, but not nearly as much as a Neanderthal. He also lacks the occipital bone of a Neanderthal, and his chin is quite prominent. Again, this man is solidly in the H. sapiens category and would not be mistaken for a member of any other hominin species. Uh, Nikolai Valuev, look at his sloping forehead and his brow ridge, and I can assure you he's alive and well. He was a championship boxer, only lost one match, and now he's a member of the Russian parliament. Good for him, I guess, except I'm not sure what good the Russian legislature is. And what about this thing called a sagittal crest? Or you might see some people where they have kind of a crest running down the middle of their head, and there's a kung fu guy with a very pronounced one. Uh, the guy up on the left there is a famous neurosurgeon, uh, and I can assure you, he's not an archaic primitive guy. And then, of course, the guy up there on the right, I mean, he captains a star cruiser across the galaxy, so, so he must be pretty smart. That's not a sagittal crest. That's a sagittal keel. A sagittal keel is a thickening of the midline of the frontal or parietal bone around the midline of the skull. It's not a sagittal crest in not being an actual crest and not anchoring jaw muscles like a sagittal crest does. In fact, that's the point of a sagittal crest to anchor jaw muscles. But anyways, these traits are still found among modern humans, but there's just a lot of variation among humans. Which trait exactly? The only trait that's even remotely archaic he's been able to show in modern humans was large brow ridges, which is one of the most variable parts of the human skull. Everything else he's shown was in every way positively indicative of an identification of Homo sapiens over and against any other identification, with the one exception of the sagittal keel, which is common in much of Homo, but again, varies a lot. I have no idea how this is supposed to argue against human evolution. 
So where do we get all these people groups anyways around the world? Well, if we go to the scriptures, we find out exactly what happened. Because at the Tower of Babel, after the flood, humans decided they would basically form. After this, he points out that humans aren't all the same. I have no idea why he thinks that's important. Well, what would happen if you confused the languages of a bunch of people? Well, you could only get so-and-so breeding with so-and-so, and you would get a bunch of genetic bottlenecks and all this diversity happening. Blah, blah, blah. Humans formed a tower to heaven, and God didn't like it, so he confused their languages and scattered them over the earth. The problem with that is that the epicenter for human genetic diversity isn't the Middle East, it's East Africa. And all non-African human diversity fits within a subset of African diversity. So humans definitively started out in Africa. That's exactly what we see. Okay, if you have kids watching, maybe send them out of the room. And feel free to pause this video to get that done. Okay, kids out of the room? Good. Look, humans are extremely horny creatures who will screw attractive conspecifics pretty darn readily, common language or not. Tompkins can import his prudish romanticized version of human sexuality into this if he wants to, but it's simply not true that confusing languages would prevent interbreeding among humans. Tompkins must be extremely sexually repressed if he thinks that that's how that works. Okay, it's safe to bring the kids back in now. Anyway, the pattern of genetic bottlenecks doesn't match the prediction from Babel, but does match an African origin for Homo sapiens. So anyways, there's a lot of data out there. But when we try and match it up with an assumption of naturalism or evolution and billions of years, it just doesn't fit. Weird then how I'm the one with the actual primary sources in my description backing up what I'm saying, but Tompkins just puts up graphs with no authorships, cites five decades old books for lay people, and gets even that wrong. And will also just blatantly lie. Whose idea does it really seem like is in defiance of the data? But when we take this data that we see out there, and it doesn't matter whether it's from biology or the fossil record or from living creatures or whatever, when we take that data and match it up with the Bible, it fits perfectly. In fact, it fits perfectly with biblical history and the things that happened in, that we are told in the book of Genesis. Weird how we shared literally none of these data with us then. So think about it like this. These are the seven C's of history. So first we have the creation. Don't care. I'm here for science or attempts at it, not biblical interpretations, no matter how alliterated. But the problem is we've got all these scientists uh, basically beating all these theologians over the head with evolution, and we have them caving into it. In other words, we have people with actual evidence about the history of the Earth just kind of pointing out that that's what they've got. And we have, and we have theologians who would like to take St. Turtle of Hippo's advice and not pretend that things about the natural world that are obviously true are actually false, and attributing this belief to the Bible. Instead, they're taking on board and adapting to the obvious and undeniable reality of the world around them. Good for them. And so that's why you have all this mixing of evolutionary ideas uh, going on at all these seminaries and Bible colleges. Yep, making your religion compatible with the much more well-evidenced claims of science is a great way to make your religion possibly true, instead of having no chance. The Christianity of young earth creationists is absolutely precluded by the physical world around us. As a result, most Christians would rather not be young earth creationists. The fact of the matter is, is that deep time, evolutionary deep time is like this magic rug that evolutionists use to sweep all their problems under. In other words, no fo fossil transitions. Well, you know, except for these. Uh, the design of living things. 
order of the universe, all these obvious things that point to creator, they just sweep it under this rug of billions of years and it all seems magical. Actually, it seems quite non-magical, because that's rather the point of methodological naturalism, to exclude magic, so that your conclusions are not magical, but rather natural. It's the creationists who would like to skip past even attempting a natural cause for these phenomena and go straight to magic. Tompkins should open up a movie theater because he's an expert at projection. And in fact, George Wald, a Nobel laureate in, in the physics and chemistry of life, uh, said this, time is in fact the hero of the plot. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible and the possible probable and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself <laughs> performs miracles. And this is from an evolutionist. Okay, some guy said a thing and it was reported on in a scoffing matter. Not sure what the takeaway is supposed to be. So evolution is basically a religious belief system. Well, it's not faith-based. It has no coherent community, no rituals, no supernatural beliefs, no moral framework, and no leadership. I have yet to ever hear a definition of religion that would make science a religion. Because remember, he's just complaining about all of science here. It has to be accepted by faith. Only if you ignore all the evidence. You know, the evidence that is the reason we call things like the Big Bang, star formation, nucleosynthesis, and evolution science. It's the thing creationists lack. That is the reason we call what they believe pseudoscience when we're being nice, and when we're being not nice. And in fact, this character, John Dunphy, even uh, admitted that in this article, A Religion for a New Age, in the Humanist magazine. And he said, I am convinced that the battleground for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as the proselytizers of a new faith, meaning evolution. Never heard of him. I can't imagine why I should care what he said. But also, since, you know, he was writing for The Humanist, I think the religion he was thinking of was humanism, which has things like a community of moral framework and some level of leadership, giving it at least some of the characteristics of religion, unlike science as such. But when we look at things logically, we look at the data logically, it's very easy to, to know that the Bible is true in all of these things. So, Funny then how this version of biblical history is precluded by all that data. After this is a commercial for some books. We're not going to that. We're cutting to the Q&A session. Okay, so the question is soft dinosaur tissue and uh, theories that the evolutionists come up with uh, for preservation of those tissues over long periods of time, including uh, a theory about iron and how it would potentially preserve those tissues. So can you speak to that, Dr. Tompkins? Yeah, a lot. You know, we find these preserved tissues and biochemicals in, in not only material from the Cretaceous where dinosaurs were found in the Jurassic, but we also find evidence of biomolecules uh, going all the way into the Cambrian layers too as well. Notice that he's not addressing the question, which wasn't about where or from when these are found, but about whether proposed mechanisms for preservation such as iron cross-linking are viable. Oh, far deeper than that, biochemicals indicated the first animals are probably about 800 million years old, long older than the Cambrian. So in many of these, many of these layers do not have iron present. The iron isn't proposed as a mechanism for all biomolecule preservation. Like for example, the steroids indicating sponges 800 million years ago simply aren't molecules that can't last for a long time if they're simply underground. The iron linkage is about collagen fibers, but he probably doesn't know that and so can't even make the connection that that's what he should talk about. And of course that, that iron theory has been totally debunked. Has it? Because that's the first I'm hearing of it, so that's going to be a big old citation needed, amigo. Anyways, we find evidence of these, these soft tissues and biochemical compounds throughout the entire rock record, not just a few dinosaur bones. So this is a common occurrence. We did not answer the question. Okay, we've got a question here from our YouTube viewers. Uh, this question is for Dr. Tompkins. Can you please explain the human chromosome 2 fusion argument and why this does not prove human evolution. No, he can't, but let's see him try. All right, well, I actually have an entire talk uh, on the human chromosome fusion too, and I could probably talk about that for an hour. Um, I would recommend going to our website. I have a fairly recent article that I published on that that has all the updated information in it. I recommend checking out Guts at Gibbon, who talks about this subject and also does this thing called getting the math right and citing actual peer-reviewed primary literature? Weird, isn't it? 
But anyways, the, the so-called signature site um, of the fusion is very corrupt. Well, yeah, a telomere to telomere fusion site would essentially be unconstrained, since one of the two centromeres will have taken over, and the two telomeres that are actually functional won't be the fused ones. Once a bit of chromosome is under essentially no selection pressure, it is bound to become degenerate, in that it'll fall into some high degree of randomness and also reduction in size. Um, it doesn't really represent a fusion of two intact telomeres, and on top of that, it's in the middle of an active uh, RNA helicase gene. Actually, the helicase gene is not in the middle of the fusion, it's distinctly on one side. It's also only weakly functional, and it's not clear that it's actually being used to produce any significant amount of helicase. But further, this helicase gene is in fact a telomere-specific gene. It's always found near the telomeres in all circumstances in humans and other animals, except in this case. So far from being a problem for chromosome 2 fusion, this is further evidence of it. So how do you get two chromosomes slamming into each other and forming an important gene? Well, it doesn't happen. Correct. It doesn't, and it didn't, and that's not what's going on here. And so I've actually got lots of evidence uh, on the fusion site is actually uh, a promoter inside this gene in the first intron of the gene. So the fusion site is actually not some accident of any kind of fusion uh, whatsoever. It's a functional uh, controlling region where transcription factors, including RNA polymerase II, bind and create RNA transcripts. Basically, that which is big words for sometimes this area is active in the nucleus and even gets transcribed. But the problem is that it's actually not very active, it's one of the least active parts of the chromosome, and spurious transcription is a thing that happens. And it does not indicate functionality, and further, spurious transcription is usually the only transcription in those relatively inactive parts of the chromosomes. Everything about this site screams chromosome fusion. I wonder what Tompkins would expect to see if the chromosomes were the result of fusion. And so yeah, that's complete nonsense. And then the so-called cryptic centromere... Uh, also is inside the middle of a gene, and it's also a very poor, a very poor signature of what supposedly was supposed to be a centromere. It really, when you look at the, the DNA sequence, it doesn't even represent that at all. Funny how literally everyone who looks at it without a prior conclusion that one specific and somewhat brain-dead interpretation of Genesis must be true comes to that conclusion. It's almost like the only reason to believe it is a bad reason. Um, but it's also in the middle of a gene, which is a huge protein-coding gene, and is a transmembrane-spanning uh, protein. Yeah, just like telomeres. Centromeres also have associated genes. Weird. And so both the so-called signatures of fusion um, are inside active functional genes. Except, you know, that's a lie. And he knows it, being himself a geneticist. And that's just the beginning of it. I actually have published out of five or six articles on the fusion um, that you can pull up that address numerous issues as to why it's not valid. So, You know, it doesn't count when you publish them in a fake journal with no peer review beyond this doesn't make us look too dumb and it agrees with our required conclusions, right? Carbon dating testing. What fallacies might be involved in that method? Well, um, you're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. You know, fair enough. I appreciate that he won't simply pretend that he doesn't have knowledge about this subject. But he also evidently didn't have any knowledge about the physics, astronomy, or geology he was talking about. So I wonder why he bothered to talk about that. But that's it. He just says after that that he has other guys to ask and gives his understanding. But since he doesn't even trust that understanding, there's no reason to nitpick it. Well, I see we've had another opportunity for some amazing evidence of creation and a young Earth that was squandered by instead just lying a bunch. It's odd how that keeps happening over and over again. Oh well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, hit the like button. If you didn't, tell me what you didn't like in the comments and hit the dislike button. Either way, I hope you hit the subscribe button and use the bell icon to turn on all notifications so you're always alerted when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Bent Hovind, Tapioca Weasel, Danny5252, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mabity Babity, San, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, Eloran Teller, Dr. Tapioca Weasel, and Pat L. Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month.
On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if the annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.